and thank you for joining us this afternoon. Um, I'm Rain Martin. I'm the Director of Advancement at the Urban Assembly. Uh, I know many of you are loyal supporters and friends of the Urban Assembly, uh, and I want to extend a warm welcome to you this afternoon to the Urban Assembly's discussion, When Back to Normal Isn't Enough, Reimagining School in 2020. Now, I know many of you have been watching and reading about the many issues that have emerged around school reopening. So we've assembled a panel of our education experts from the UA to shed some light on the challenges and opportunities in public education right now and what we're doing to manage through uh, this time of crisis. Um, as you know, the Urban Assembly is a school support organization and our mission is to advance students' social and economic mobility by improving public education. Uh, we currently support a network of 23 schools in New York and like the rest of the city, our schools have been grappling with reopening, hybrid education um, and health and safety concerns. Um, however, even though, you know, where this time is challenging, uh, we do see many new trends and opportunities emerging, uh, as well as the opportunity to create an overall stronger and uh, more equitable system of public education in the city, which is what um, most of our discussion will be centered around this afternoon. So first, let me introduce you to our panel. We have Kristen Kearns Jordan. Uh, she's been the CEO of the UA since 2016. Um, she is a former nonprofit funder and is also um, a charter school founder. We have David Adams, uh, the Senior Director of Strategy. He is the former Director of Social Emotional Learning at the UA and also the author of the book, The Educator's Practical Guide to Emotional Intelligence. We have Lindsay Dixon. She is the Senior Director of Post-Secondary Readiness. Um, Lindsay is a former uh, public school teacher in a career in technical education school um, and has worked with many uh, workforce development organizations. Um, and our last panelist is Jalissa Baez, the director of alumni services, uh, alumni success, sorry. Uh, prior to coming to the UA, Jalissa has helped build training programs at higher education institutions and nonprofit organizations. So our moderator for today is Jane Martinez Dowling. Jane is the Chief External Office Affairs Officer at KIPP NYC, uh, a charter uh, school network. Uh, Jane is also an esteemed member of our Board of Trustees and has served on the board for the past two years. Um, before I turn it over to Jane, I just wanted to let you guys know really quickly that we uh, are going to be doing a brief uh, question and answer um, at the end of the discussion. So if you have questions, feel free to drop them in the Q&A chat box at the bottom of the screen. Uh, so Jane, to your show. Hi everyone. As Rain said, uh, I'm Jane Martinez Dowling and I am thrilled to be here with all of you today. Um, I have been on the UA board for the past couple of years um, and it's been really a, a pleasure to work with uh, my fellow board members and also the amazing staff. Um, and so we're gonna just jump right in um, and put our uh, CEO, Kristen, um, in the spotlight with some opening questions. So, hi, Kristen. Hi, um, So let's start off with, what do you think are the greatest stressors on the system right now? Um, and, and most of the people on this call have read about or seen directly what the stressors are. And if you're parents, um, you see it at your home. If you're educators, um, you're grappling with it at school. But I think it's, it's one of those multivariable calculus problems that can't be solved, right? You can't, at the same time, meet every child's learning and social and emotional needs. Um, protect the public health, um, make your budget meet, your ends meet, um, social distancing requires more teachers, more space, um, and COVID has attacked our economy um, as well as our health. And so what, what teachers, what principals are, are trying to do is to figure out how to do the least harm. Um, and they're also trying to figure out how to focus on what's most important and having some of the students in school, some of the students on Zoom, um, monitoring uh, the health of their communities just requires more than has ever been asked of them before. And I, I, I stand just in awe uh, of our principals who are making this work for kids. So that's a great segue. We all know that principals are working really, really hard um, leading through this incredible time. 
What do you think is the greatest challenges that are facing them as school leaders? I think what's hardest for them is, you know, principals tend to be planners, right? They they start in March to plan their their school year, their program, they do their hiring, they they and so by the time you get to a school year, a principal knows kind of what's what's ahead. They've typically planned until June. And this year the the information and the circumstances have changed so rapidly um, that they've programmed their schools you know, 15, 20 times in some cases. Um, they've had to navigate the sort of decisions that the Department of Education makes, which change. Um, and so I think it's the sort of the uncertainty and the inability to sort of have a long range plan. I think they also just, you know, like, like, like human beings want to meet the needs of their young people and they know that, they, that they're gonna have to make trade-offs um, and that, that never feels good. You know, we, we, most of us are on, uh, or all of us are on this call, I think it's safe to say, we got into education uh, because we wanted to make things better for kids, right? We wanted to reduce the inequities in the, in the system. Um, and, and usually at the end of the year, we feel like we have moved the ball forward. Um, this year is, is not like that, right? This year, we're just trying to um, keep our kids afloat, uh, keep our schools afloat um, and, and mitigate the, the dangers as best we can. Thank you, Kristen. I'm gonna come back to you, but as you talked about the challenges for principals, I'm going to bring it to the rest of the team to talk about you know, other folks um, with whom we work. Um, and I'm gonna start off with Lindsay. Lindsay, what do you think are the greatest challenges facing teachers? Um, can we spend the whole hour just on that or? <laughs> Um, it's, it's massive. So I, I was a former high school teacher for years in the Bronx, um, with the New York city department of education. And, you know, like I thought I knew what stress was, um, when I was a teacher and this, it, this is unlike anything that has, has ever been faced by teachers in our, in our country, certainly within the last hundred years or more. Um, I think the, the main challenges stem for how, how rapidly things are changing, uh, within one week, there can be policy changes from the city and the state that, you know, get rolled out or disseminated or, or change because conditions on the ground are changing. Um, so I think policy changes are a big thing that they're grappling with, really even understanding how it affects them in their classroom. What does this mean for my um, IEP meeting I'm supposed to have with a parent and one of my students this week, this, this small, seemingly small policy change that just got rolled out? Um, or that's still unclear, because there's still a lot that folks um, are working really hard to figure out, but haven't figured it out yet. Um, so that's definitely one. Um, these openings and closings happening, some of our schools are, are closed to in person right now because they're in that red zone. Um, what will that look like it kind of they, they plan so hard and then and then you know the conditions changed um, testing requirements we're still not necessarily certain what federal and state waivers we're going to get what are what does testing look like when you don't even get to really engage with your students in the normal process um, and higher ed policy is also shifting so the the SATs and and ACTs are, are not the thing that our high school students are going to necessarily focus on as much this year because many if not most schools are doing um, test blind and test optional and so like that's something that a teacher used to anchor in so I think just like I just listed off like five things. I could probably list off 50 from the top of my head that teachers are having to sit with. And they're always, they're usually like um, a few, few degrees removed from the initial communication. So things are gonna filter through them. Sometimes it, it can take a while for them to really understand what's happening. Um, I think the, the last point I would make is just that this massive switch to e-learning, like I studied e-learning as a graduate student for years. This is something it takes years to get good at, to learn how to do blended learning instruction and e-learning instruction. And our teachers have had to learn this in weeks and in just a few months, what most practitioners spend years doing. Um, and it has completely shifted the way that they deliver content, um, the types of the engagements and interactions they do with students. So this is massive. This is not just a teacher teaching in a normal year, but oh, there's a pandemic and maybe their parents too. So they're, they're struggling with the overwhelm we're all struggling with, but they're, they're trying to practice their craft in a way that they have never had to do before. And so they're also learning all of those technical pieces and everyone's having you know, technical issues. And, and when it's a student who might be a middle school student, like then that teacher is now tech support for a class of 120 kids. Um, so it's, it's a lot. There, there are so many things that teachers are wrestling with and, and probably the folks I have the most empathy for in the United States right now. Um, so we're, we're, we're very grateful that we're in a position to do our best to support them, but it is a massive amount um, that is resting on them right now and a lot of uncertainty. Lindsay, thank you. So 
We talked about principals and we talked about teachers. Um, Dave, what do you think are the greatest challenges facing our kids, our students? Hi, Jane. Uh, thanks for, for the question. I appreciate it. Um, appreciate the, the opportunity to, to think about what it means to be successful in a uh, an environment in which our students need to really think about what does it mean to have self-directed learning. Um, I think for many years now, the, the Urban Assembly has invested in the types of social and emotional skills uh, that help enable students to, to solve problems, um, to manage themselves, to set and achieve goals. And in fact, when we talk to our alumni, uh, given despite those ex uh, investments, it's still the one area in which our alumni are asking for the most support. Uh, how do I manage my time? How do I organize my space? Um, how do I understand uh, how to identify um, what a learning target is and then take it upon myself uh, to pursue that? So um, I think this continues to be the opportunity for us is, is to really take this moment um, and watch what our students are doing to shift. Uh, how are our students being successful in this space? How have they taken on responsibility for learning? Um, and how do we take those learnings and translate them when we get back into the classroom, one, um, and then two, to understand that that is the type of learning that they need to be using to be successful in a post-secondary environment. Uh, in that post-secondary context, they will not be having people asking them where their assignments are. They will not having people ha um, uh, feeding them in terms of where their homework is. Uh, they will need to be able to manage the time. And I'm gonna give you one last example of this from my own house and I'll turn it over. Uh, it is a social and emotional learning house, as you would expect in Adam's house to be. Uh, and my son said that my, my Spanish teacher gives me a lot of extra time. And so I, uh, my son's name is Elijah. So I use that time to go back and finish the assignments that I haven't completed yet. Um, it's those kinds of skills, that sense of responsibility that's going to allow him and all of our students who are exposed to these skills to be successful, not only in school, but in life. Dave, thank you. Um, I'm going to get one, click down to one more level of specificity. Julissa, um, you work with many of our high school students who are sort of transitioning to the next phase, like Dave alluded to. Mm -hmm. Are there any special things that you saw your high school kids dealing with um, both in the spring and now this in the, during the fall? Yeah, absolutely. So because we had the, the luxury of engaging our alums for years after they graduate, we actually experienced the effects of the pandemic pretty early on, um, even before district schools closed. Uh, when colleges started, started to close themselves, we saw our students lose, lose financial aid, lose their housing, lose their employment, um, start to transition into online learning and how much they were struggling with that. So we knew pretty early on that the class of 2020 was going to need additional support in that transitional period. Um, and through our summer bridge program, our, our, our peer coaching program that we offer to all of our students, we were able to mobilize our alums to support students as they were making those final decisions. And what we saw is that a lot of students just opted for safety. And safety this time around meant something a little different, which was staying close to home and going for the most affordable options. So we worked through our coaches to make sure that students were making decisions that were um, good for them and their families, particularly if they were hit by COVID-19, but also that those students that had really good opportunities that might have felt a little risky because of where we were in the pandemic and the economic crisis, didn't lose those opportunities to go to really good institutions or maximize their financial aid packages. Um, so we we saw both, right? We saw students trying to stay close to their families, making really hard decisions about their options post-secondary. We saw them lose financial aid and housing opportunities and all of that. And we worked through our coaches and through our network of schools to support that transition as much as, as, much as possible. Thanks, Julissa. Dave, I'm gonna come back to you. You were super optimistic in talking about what the opportunities are in this moment for our students and skills that they need to probably have moving forward. Well, what do you think are the broader implications of COVID on how we most effectively support um, our schools and educators? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think the when we are understanding um, what inequity looks like, it feels like, and tastes like, um, it's hard to have not looked at the last six months um, and have one's eyes opened if, if they were not open before. Um, what it means to access education as an opportunity for social and economic mobility um, has played out so differently depending on what students' access has been. 
uh, whether that is access to broadband, whether that's access to a learning environment that is safe or conducive to learning, where did that space, right? Um, schools in the past, to the extent that they've been able to, have been a, a, a they they've they've helped equalize those issues, right? Even if you have six people in your house, uh, you have a desk in your classroom, right? You have a space that you can you can go there to. Um, and so what we've done is we've kind of constrained the support systems that were available to students from grandparents uh, to civic organizations, to churches, to schools, down to a very small kind of uh, nuclear family space. And if your nuclear family is really struggling, um, it's been hard for students to access um, supports outside of that area. Uh, now, when I talk about opportunities, it, it's because um, as we are seeing these things, we're seeing educators now move and say, oh, we need to go see where our kids are at, right? We need to go visit homes. Or we've been visiting homes for 20 years, right? At the Urban Assembly, people have said, oh, we need to pay attention to the social emotional dimensions of learning. It turns out, as my wife would say, my uh, Elijah can get this, but he seems frustrated by the learning. Well, well, that's a thing, right? And it's been a thing whether or not it's been in COVID or not. Um, and as educators have been seeing this more implicit uh, um, challenges become explicit, what does it mean to look inside a child's home and see the conditions in which they go to every single day and then come to school ready to learn to the best of their ability? And our, our teachers are saying, wow, I never knew that's what it took for little Johnny, for Jalissa, for David, for Rain to get to my school in that place. I never knew that my, the 15 year old is taking care of the 10 year old who's taking care of the four, five year old and I'm hitting him up and putting zeros in his book uh, because he didn't get his homework in. So that kind of insight that has been given to our teachers cannot be taken away. And it's my greatest hope that we translate that insight to systems and supports when we get back into school to recognizing what does it mean to learn and what all of our students bring to the table with regards to uh, their aptitude. So you think that there's an opportunity now to integrate social emotional learning um, further into academic programming? Yes, uh, as we said before, right? Every aspect of learning has social and emotional dimensions to it. Um, uh, engagement is a function of interest and interest is a function of, of attention. Um, and so I think as we're looking at this, this time, um, we're, we're seeing teachers now recognize what students can, be, can do when given the responsibility. What does it mean to come back to break on time? Because nobody, nobody's gonna check up on you. If you're not there, you're not there, right? But we see students come back when teachers have put forth these systems to create that sense, I don't wanna miss it, right? We've seen students reach out to each other when teachers are not able to, to, um, to get in contact with them through phones, through structures like crew, right? Because those are, the, those are the social systems that they wanna be a part of. Now that we've been intentional about that, it's about taking that intentionality back into the, the real world um, and making sure that our students have a place that they belong in schools, our teachers are understanding what it means to invest in our social emotional learning, um, and all students have access to high quality instruction. And again, you know, I, I'd like to give a shout out to the Urban Assembly for being ahead of the curve. Uh, these are things that we've cared about before there was a pandemic, and these are the things that we're going to care about when the pandemic passes. Thank you, David. It's super inspiring. Uh, I'm going to uh, zoom out a little bit and go back to Kristen and ask, um, given what you're hearing from your team, do you think that there is more danger or more opportunity in public, in public education this year? Um, it's probably a cheat to say both, and I refuse to answer the question, <laughs> but, um, but here's how I would answer that. I think near term this year, right, during the COVID crisis, um, there's more danger, right? And, and, and it is already played out um, with health outcomes, with learning outcomes, um, with social and emotional harm. I think if you look five years down the road, um, and you don't have to be a, a super Pollyanna type, um, you just have to you know, have hope, which is a decision. Um, I, I see opportunity for the young people um, who are following, right? I believe that educators right now to pick up on some of Dave's themes are really asking themselves, what is the purpose of my lesson? Why am I teaching young people whatever it is, if it's an algebra concept, if it's a, um, an event in, um, in US history, how does this connect to their experience? Um, why, why do I teach this? So you have this real sort of purpose that's, that's been elevated. And I would say also from a student's perspective, from a parent's perspective, 
um, as they look at both K to 12, and as they look at higher education, they're asking themselves, what is the value proposition? What is this school going to deliver for me, for my son, for my daughter? Um, and that accountability is a very powerful um, lever as teachers have to respond to parents' demand and their own questions about their purpose. And so I think what I see is a mindset shift already happening um, that when we go back to buildings and we're together in, um, you know, in human form, um, all of us, um, will, will be a real opportunity for, um, for building better schools. Thank you, Kristen. So all of those questions are super intriguing. And I think about your content experts, right? Um, I, I'm gonna ask first Julissa, once again, to really talk to us about what she's seeing with the young adults that she works with and if their plans have changed um, given the new conditions and how they've responded to it. Um, and you know how she sees this really having young people pivot um, in terms of the future. And then after her response, I'd love to ask Lindsay a little bit more about the higher ed piece and how um, you know what she thinks higher ed should be doing. So um, Julissa, what do you think? What are your young folks, um, the young adults that you work with, how are they changing their plans? Yeah, I think uh, David started to mention some of this in the past, like we have learned for years now from our alumni that one of the things that they need the most is their ability to find the tools to pivot and to be flexible. And that is particularly the case with the class of 2020. Um, college was, if you were a senior in high school in May of 2020, and you were thinking about your college experience or your post-secondary plans in general, there were a lot of questions about whether or not institutions will be open or not, will be offering all the services that they had before. So students had to pivot to really think about the value of higher education and the value of continuing their training in, in, in the context of a global pandemic and global economic crisis in a way that we encourage all of our students to do, particularly to our career and technical education schools and um, uh, all of the all of that we do to provide students with experiential learning, they already know some of this. But for the class of 2020, it was right there in their faces about if college is not going to look the way that it looked in the past, if this experience is not what I thought it was going to be, what is it that I really do need for myself, for my family, for my community? What skills and experiences I can get right now that I can go and turn that into a career that I can move up in um, in the future? And what are the avenues that I have at my disposal to get the, the fasters? And I think that that's one of the, the, the shifts that we saw the most for the class of 2020 in terms of um, going into community colleges at a higher rate and thinking about, well, this two-year credential can get me somewhere quicker and it's more affordable. Maybe this is more appeal appealing to me right now than um, another post-secondary plan. And one of the things that we try to, to consider is like, then that what does that mean for the class of 2021? Um, as we're having a whole year to prepare for what could be a pretty um, unstable and pretty ambiguous environment for higher education and post secondary planning, um, what are some of the things that we want to reinforce with the class of 2021? And I go back to career readiness and social and emotional learning for sure, making sure that students have the, the skills and tools and knowledge to navigate those spaces really well. Thank you. So Lindsay, I heard the phrase, what's the value proposition of college right now? And what are parents thinking? Um, what do you think is, uh, is the way that higher ed should be responding um, and what do they need to sort of change right now in this moment in time to survive? Um, I think this, you said the word survive and I think if they're going to survive and some colleges will not, some colleges have already closed. Um, just a few days ago, University of South Florida said that they're shuttering their entire education program. That's in like the number eight district in the in the um, country for, for a number of students. So I think if um, higher education institutions are going to survive, they really do have to focus on that uh, return on investment that Jalissa and others have spoken about. And, um, you know, this is a big part of our work at the Urban Assembly. So we're going to be equipping young people and their parents and families to ask that question, even more so like, to Jalissa's point, if, if you're going to take the risk of leaving your town and leaving your little bit of whatever safety net you might have been able to build, um, and you know either go away or pay a fair amount of money for tuition, that return of investment has to be there. And and higher education is still a really good bet for many of our students, but it has to be the right institution, the right major that's going to you know sync up with um, everything that they learn through social and emotional learning, their identity and their skills and their purpose and their goals. Like that should be manifested through their major. Um, and that major should have options on the labor market. We should not be sending young people and too many colleges are still sending young people into majors that uh, 
uh, graduate students that there are far too many of those majors for their area. Um, and so I think the one big shift they have to do is switch out of this idea of one size fits all education. Our, our minds in, in the United States since about 1920 um, or a little after have been locked into this idea of just the bachelor's degree is the only router, just these certain majors. And I think um, Jalissa spoke really powerfully to the, the benefits of, of a young person feeling like they can get a credential earlier in that process, even if still in route to that four-year degree. So I think things like stackable credentials, which um, if you haven't heard of those, is the idea that you can get like little pieces of credentials that have value and cachet on the market. So you can get, I went to Rutgers for one year to get my um, industry certification in project management because it was a thing I needed for a past job. And it still actually opens doors for me. That layered in and could layer in with a, an associate's degree. That can layer in with badges and other types of credentials. And then about bachelor's degree. And then you can go on and get like my colleague Jalissa just did like a micro master's. That's a type of a stackable credential that you can get in a year or less when most master's degrees take two to three years. Um, so the world has really changed. And I think students and families are going to be demanding this type of benefit if they're going to sink money into your institution for four years. Uh, when most people in the United States do not have a bachelor's degree, you have to give them some benefit in process, you have to give them some benefit um, in, the, in, in that route to uh, a terminal degree or, or a, um, a degree like a bachelor's. And then I think the, the final thing I'd say is schools have to pivot and take on this genuine ownership of um, supporting young people with internships, like internships, career placement. It is, it's not enough to just offer up some type of um, random menu and a la carte, oh, take a class in philosophy, you know, pick whatever you want over here, have an arts class, and then maybe good luck and you'll get a job. Like I think if, if colleges want to compete for our young people, which is the way they should be thinking about it, and the way we want our young people and families to be thinking about it, if they're going to compete, they're going to need to say, okay, after you finish two or four years at our institution, these are the types of salaries you're going to be able to command. These are the types of experiences that you're going to be able to have. And these are all the different range of stackable credentials that we're going to make available to you. Um, I think they, that we really have to pivot because right now it's this very, uh, it's this model where colleges have been in the, in the driver's seat and they're just able to anticipate that there will be a ton of demand for their products and services. I think they need to really really change the way that they think about and market themselves to students and families. Um, and we're definitely going to be preparing our urban assembly students to ask those questions. Show me your return on investment for this amount of tuition. What do I get? Because I am an asset. I'm going to come to your institution with all of my knowledge and skills. I'm going to help build this um, institution up and be a part of it. So um, we, I, I think higher ed needs to make several of those pivots really quickly um, if they're going to make themselves appealing to all the, the folks that Jalissa is working with who are making those hard decisions right now. Yeah, and if I may add to that, Jane, really quickly, one of the things that we're already seeing some of these changes because some institutions really have um, like a pulse on this. Um, if we look at CUNY, for example, the Senior University of New York is one of the largest urban education institutions, higher education institutions. They already rolled out uh, really robust, for example, mental health services and emergency programs for their students that are not just focusing on the academics and tuition piece, which has host, always been a challenge for students, but also thinking about the, the student as a whole human that has different needs, that has different um, things to bring to the table and how to invest in those human beings to make sure that, you, that they do get that return on investment that Lindsay is talking about because a, a college or training program is no more just a training program like you're you're developing human beings and active uh, members of society. So we've seen some of some really um, uh, inspiring pieces come out out of higher ed already, not nearly what we wanted to see for our students and our families. Thank you both, um, you know, being, having worked in college success and post-secondary readiness, um, the world has changed very, very quickly. Um, but these are things that those of us who've been practitioners have known for, for many years for the students, um, you, you know, with the profile that we have at KIPP or at UA. And so really, really um, grateful for all the work that you all are doing and, you know, both on the theoretical side, but also having, you know, boots on the ground. Um, before we um, turn over to some of the questions that have been coming in, I'd love to turn it over to Kristen um, and just kind of any final thoughts before we move to Q&A with regard to the work that you're doing at UA as you plan and strategize. Uh, you bet. Thank you, Jane. Um, 
I think that one of the themes that uh, I'm picking up with my colleagues here um, is this idea of flexibility. Um, I was thinking while Lindsay and Jalissa were talking about how there's an opportunity also for employers to um, connect to schools in a different way. I, I know that the way that time is used in schools has been completely disrupted. Um, and when we put it back together again, I'm not sure we're gonna recreate exactly what we left. I don't think we're gonna create 50 minute blocks where we march students from one room to the next with these disconnected pieces that don't necessarily lead to career, um, sort of don't, don't connect to their future careers. What, what I see instead is a much more kind of integrated kind of learning where students will go deeper um, and also potentially have internships, you know, in the middle of a day, right? The, the, the concept of seat time is one of those 1920s, 1930s um, vestiges where the education um, is measured not by what kids know and what standards they have met, but rather how many you know minutes they have spent sitting in a particular seat, um, attentive potentially to a, a particular subject. And so what I invite the group to do here um, is to think creatively with us, right? You know, we, we, we are in the education space, people here on the call, but those of you who are attending um, are in various workplaces and, and you probably have uh, opinions upon uh, what high school and college um, graduates should bring to, to the workforce. And so I think it's a real opportunity now for engagement with the broader community to build a better school system. Thank you. So our host, Rain, tells us that uh, our team has done such an amazing job that there are no questions. Um, so we. I think there's one now, but maybe we could get more. We would love to have a little bit of a dialogue with the audience. So, um, you know, we shared a lot of information and, and, and so much, you know, wise and thoughtful commentary um, about so much of the work that we're doing um, and would love for folks to just chime in in the Q&A and ask some questions about the work or anything that kind of was sticky with you as we were um, doing the discussion. Yes. Um... Uh, we do have uh, a question here in the Q&A, but um, once again, feel free to drop your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. So let's see. Uh, first question. Um, this is anonymous attendee. Which majors are no longer viable? Um, I'm going to kick that over to you, Lindsay. Yeah, great question. And I'd say I'm sure Jalissa can um, jump in on that too. There's, I think there's two ways to think about viability. There's viability within your local or hyper-local context. So um, if you wanted to major, for instance, in supply chain logistics, um, but your region is moving away from that, um, that might be a reason why you wouldn't think it is viable anymore. Um, or your supply chain logistics majors, you can look at the um, like what is being covered by your college or by your degree program. And it might still be focused on like old school topics like picking and packing and forklift driving. Like literally forklift driving is still the, the required test that New York State Education Department requires for our CTE high schools. Um, if you wanna get certified as a CTE school specifically in supply chain logistics and like very few people anymore are employed. It's all Amazon robots and it's all, you you know, interoperable uh, robots working in collaboration with humans. And so like if you, it's not necessarily the major that has gone away, but that specific emphasis within that major is, is going away. So I'd say that's one thing about viability, look in your local context. Um, the other thing I'd say about vi viability is to look at the national context in relation to automation and things like artificial intelligence. So something like finance is still excellent to go into, but bookkeeping is in always like the top three things that are gonna get automated and have already been automated. So specific um, majors like bookkeeping would be, don't do it. Um, <laughs> that's definitely something that is, is being um, phased out. But so finance, it's thinking more about um, how, how can I work with technology? How can I use uh, more advanced uh, finance and business topics? Um, I, the liberal arts are back, y'all. It's all about the human skills. So if you can do um, English degrees, business degrees, um, and things that will give you those human skills, the, the top skill in all 16 sectors in the United States is creative problem solving and like creative creativity and collaboration. Um, we need people who can think and, and see a situation and, and find the problem in it and, and do patterns. Um, so I, I think like things like 
bookkeeping, you know, don't truck driving some of the su supply chain logistics, those are actually outmoded, we shouldn't be offering them anymore. And then the other is that look at your local context, like there's too many people applying to John Jay for criminal justice, then there are jobs in New York City within like crime scene investigation. So the major is still good, but not in this area, you probably should think about a pivot. Yeah, and I'll I don't just know if Jalissa, you want to add anything briefly. Uh, yeah, I just add to that. We we talk to students about backwards designing from the job of like that they want to go into, and thinking about the skills and competencies that they'll need to do that, and the experiential learning that they need to do that, like the internships, what type of um, connections would they need, not just like the tangible um, knowledge. And the reason why we do that is because we know, as uh, our alumni are graduating from college and other training programs, that they may have like that thing that says psychology or whatever on the, their resume, uh, but if they can't show to an employer what they can do, the skills that they have, how they can solve problems, and also if they don't have typically the, the access to the right social networks, they won't be able to get into that career ladder job that then will lead them to social and economic mobility. So instead of thinking about, is a psychology major a good thing anymore? What we teach our students to think about is like, what skills are you learning? What is the alumni network of that institution that you're going into and how are they connected to that psychology career that you're trying to look into what are what experiences can you do while you're still in college or in your training program what type of internships what type of projects can you do research can you learn how to do social design or whatever it is that you want to go into um, so your school may still be offering that major but you really need to dig it deeper into the program the sequence of courses how long is it going to take you to get to the actual courses in that major so a lot of our schools may get you may accept you into the college but not into the major once you get there so like we, it's, it's navigational skills and understanding Understanding that they are ultimately constructing a career. They are ultimately building, uh, putting together the building blocks to get into that career ladder job. And if that particular program at that particular institution is not doing that for them, that is not a major, viable major anymore. Great. Um, so our next question is interesting one. What is the, if another anonymous uh, question, what is the best way slash best practice uh, to structure a high school internship program from a company perspective? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give Lindsay a breath and just say um, that I think this is an area for creativity. So um, it used to be, you know, back uh, at least six months ago, that um, internships were thwarted by the fact that kids needed to be in school until three o'clock. And so what do you do, you know, from four to five? So I think just starting to think about the day more flexibly, um, there, are, there are all kinds of creative things that are happening. And I, I, I'm gonna flip to Lindsay now um, to talk about the virtual internships that, um, that she led and created this summer, literally on a dime. Um, thanks, Kristen. That's just where my mind went was um, this is one of the possibilities for the future if we can um, change and, and really uh, update the way that we think about time and seat time, which is still locked into that Carnegie unit from, you know, the late 1800s. Um, we ran an internship program this, this summer for about um, 80 to 100 students and, and matched them with all kinds of wonderful companies. And what the companies were saying, since this question was specifically about companies, the companies were just saying like, you know, we need folks who have the flexibility to complete these projects or work on these projects. And so to Kristen's point, the, the anti-best practice is to tell uh, a company, oh, you can have, you know, 10, 12th graders, but they're only available from four to five, like two days a week. That's not an internship. Um, you know, that's, that's volunteering. Um, and so I think um, what we did was make sure that these uh, internships were robust and available online to Kristen's point. We created this entire program for that. And what worked well for the employers was um, having an intermediary like the urban assembly or someone else do a lot of the student development work and working with these young people so that the employers could focus even just sometimes once or twice a week on, um, you know, doing that needs analysis, talking about the projects that they wanted the young people to work on and, and giving them feedback. So every single week we would have young people pitch their products and pitch their ideas and, and their work to, to the employer. So we're really maximizing employer time too because employees are stretched. Companies are stretched right now as well. Um, I'd say my final quick thing is when we do shift back into in-person, um, there are amazing companies uh, like Here to Here who is really leading the way and working with um, like the career-wise apprenticeship program. They are working with schools to actually restructure their day. Just to Kristen's point, the best practice for an internship is to let a kid go for the whole day 
or at the very least half of a day. Um, and you can do that if you look differently at your calendar and don't we don't lock our brains into the world before COVID. Um, and so these are 11th graders and 12th graders and then soon to be alumni who are now within the UA and other school networks participating in the most premier pre-apprenticeship early apprenticeship program in the entire country. And they're only able to participate because they're gonna be able to leave the building on like every Tuesday and Thursday and do all their other classwork Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Um, and they're going to see amazing benefits and the companies are going to benefit. The, com the company actually needs time with that young person, um, not bound by like when the, the, the regulations say that they are allowed to leave the building. So I'd love to see this be one of the things that we leave in the past. And we really trust our young people who are 17, 18 and 19 years old and about to go leave and, and go out into the world on their own, we owe it to them to help them practice in a more safe environment, like what it's like to get up and like go do that day of work, not an hour here and there, but like an actual day. So I'd love to see that. Can I add one more thought? Sorry, I know we're going long on this question, but um, one of the other things that companies that um, have to offer that folks might not be aware of is that they can offer feedback to schools on what is necessary in today's labor force. You know, education is a little bit insular. People sort of, be, they, they go to school, right? K to 12 and then to college, and then they go to schools of education and they become teachers and then go back into schools, right? And it's a bit of a closed loop. And so what, what schools need, um, and what our founder Richard Kahn was aware of, you know, long before I think the rest of the industry was, is access to other, um, other fields. You know, what does it mean to be successful in computer science? What does it mean to be successful um, in a, you know, in a sort of industry lab, which may look different from a bio lab right at a high school. And so, um, so either through these internship opportunities or through, you know, there's usually an opportunity to kind of connect with kids, um, but also think about connecting with the adults in the school and helping support sort of more relevant um, and career um, connected education. Great. Um, so, Lindsay, I see you kind of answered and then went and further answered uh, Bob Flanagan's question. Thank you, Bob, for asking. Um, Christina Beicher is asking, there are some resources that the DOE may not always be able to provide. What would be the best uses of private donation dollars? It's a great question. Yeah, I, can I take this one and then others can chime in. Um, thank you so much, Christina, for that question. Um, one of the things that um, a not-for-profit like the Urban Assembly has is flexibility to innovate. And so it takes a long time in a public institution that you know serves a million young people um, for new ideas to get sort of um, created, to get tested, um, to go through iterative processes, um, then which makes them uh, ready for scaling. And so the, the, the role I believe of private philanthropy is to support innovation zones, right? That where we can, and we, we consider ourselves an innovation zone at the Urban Assembly, where we can pilot um, ideas, test them in three schools, then test them in 10 schools. Um, Fred Walsh, the superintendent of, of the Urban Assembly schools is on the call, right? We have this very close partnership with the Department of Education. And so if something well, if something fails, we cast it away, right? And um, don't mess with it anymore. But if something is working, Fred then has 25 schools that aren't urban assembly schools who could try it and who are brought together in a principal's meeting. We'll see you tomorrow, Fred, at that meeting. Um, and to the system as a whole. And so I, I, um, I actually would love, Dave has sort of um, thoughts on how to scale innovation, but I think that's the core of the, um, of the answer. Thank you, Kristen. Um, yeah, I think you answered that really clearly. Uh, the most important thing that private dollars can do is help create proof, proofs of concept um, for the educational system. It is a, it's a difficult thing for the education system to, to invest um, into ideas that have no, uh, have no demonstration of their effectiveness. Uh, and then when you look at the innovation zones, right, if you look at higher education, um, higher education uh, tends to innovate separate from the K to 12 system because they have no clear channels to take their thoughts and ideas and then to test them in, in a K to 12 setting. Most of the higher education context are not uh, part and parcel in the, in the K to 12 space. Um, we have charter schools who are innovating but disseminating those innovations predominantly to other charter schools. Um, and so uh, what we need to think about is how do we create these spaces um, that demonstrate proof of concept 
um, without taxing the public education space because most public education dollars are accounted for. Uh, so to be able to have a, a private person say, you know, Urban Assembly, I'd like you to think about how you can test this idea, evaluate it and scale it. Um, so then we can understand what the impact could be. That changes the game. Um, and it's a, it's a game that is uniquely suited to institutions like the UA uh, to play effectively. Don't just, don't, don't unmute just yet, David. I got a question for you. Another anonymous question. What is the single most important state or city policy change that would help schools move in the direction we need to go? Yeah, thank you, Rain. Um, so it's hard for me to think about the, the most important single state or, or policy change. It's such an easy question, you know? <laughs> Um, I mean, Lindsay talked about this a lot. I can tell you what we have seen um, has reduced the burden for us to innovate effectively. And I can come up with three, three things that the Urban Assembly has done um, in this context of COVID-19 that I think produces opportunities. Uh, the first uh, is, is think about how do we offer courses to students across our schools um, and, and give students credit for those courses not being tied to a specific school. So uh, one of the things that we've identified at the Urban Assembly, for example, as part of the small school's constraints, we can't offer all courses to all students in terms of their post-secondary success. Um, and so one of the things that the COVID space has given us the opportunity to do is think about how we are more flexible given city policy to give students opportunity to take courses at multiple schools at the Urban Assembly um, so that they can have access to our whole suite of courses rather than just their school's courses. And those are, those, are, uh, those are issues of policy, those are issues of how the city organizes their schools, not issues of innovation. So that's the first thing I would say that, that this has given us um, an opportunity to do. The next uh, piece is what Lindsay had talked about. Um, across the country, we're redefining what engagement is. What does it mean to be engaged in public school? What does it mean to have seat time? Um, across the country, schools are sitting down with themselves and saying, you know, if I give an assignment and a student hands it in, right, do I need to, to, to count for three hours of time or can I just see that that student has taken the, the, the work to assign it? When we rethink these opportunities, and I, again, Lindsay and Jalissa have said this really clear, now we have thought about, man, we can open up internship, time, internship times. Our CTE teachers have been constrained severely by their ability to work in industry and work in education. That is a policy decision at the state level and at the city level that we're starting to be more flexible with, right? If we can have a city person who is in an industry today engage with our kids, that is 10 years of experience that it would take the city or the, or the state to catch up with in their policies and their goals, right? Because we're about 10 years behind with regards to how they work at that time. So. Uh, the first thing I would say is um, students taking classes. The second thing I would say is uh, flexibility and seat time. Um, and, and the last thing I would say is um, understanding, and I, and I think Lindsay talked about this, is, is the Carnegie unit. Uh, what does it mean to be in class and to be um, participating in education? I would love for us to be able to see um, how we organize learning experiences in ways that reflect the ways that students will learn in their actual lives. In their real life, students will not sit in the class, have somebody talk to them, and then they take a test. It's just not how the real life works. That's how education. Kristen doesn't ask you to take tests? No. <laughs> oh. I don't. I, no. I want to add a little bit to that. I want to add a little bit to that, David, actually. And I think uh, um, I, I come from the government sector and I come from the policymaking people that want to change everything with changing rules and like rules and, and laws and stuff. And I, and I think the thing that I do have to say about education and what we can do differently is uh, focus on skill set versus just the knowledge for the sake of knowledge. And to go back to uh, a, a system in which we saw education as part of our workforce and economic policy machine. Um, we have seen those sectors uh, traditionally as separate things that we educate on one end, and then we have economic policy jobs and, and supply and demand and all these other things 
things on another end. Um, those two things are intertwined. And as uh, until we start to see our ed education system as the pipeline that we have of workers and entrepreneurs in this country, we're not gonna be able to put those things together and see the economic outcomes that we wanna see and see social and emotional mobility for our students. We'll have a lot of people who know a lot of things. We have a lot of people with a lot of degrees on their walls, but does that translate into economic prosperity for our local economies? That is something that cities and states can definitely take on as part of their economic policy. Great. Can I add one more thought? I'm sorry, Absolutely. I'm, not, I'm making this um, a series of answers, but I think there's also a system response on policy to making schools more equitable. Um, you know, mm -hmm. Jalissa focused on sort of the, the workforce connection, Dave, within the, within the school and across schools. Uh, but if we look at the New York City public schools, um, there are just dramatic inequities in terms of who gets access to which schools. Uh, we screen students based on their grades, based on their um, test scores. Um, but what that's really measuring is um, economic advantage in most cases. Um, and so I think there's an opportunity to change some of these enrollment policies at the Department of Education and create a more equitable system and a more integrated system. Great, great, great. Um, we have one more question and we'll make this the last question. Um, and if we can answer this really quickly before we run out of time, um, how can classes in high school be set up to meet both traditional learning standards as well as being college and career ready? They can't. <laughs> um, I can answer quickly and then, I mean, I think, I I, it was an anonymous person. I'm not sure what, you know, um, context that's coming from, but this idea of like traditional learning standards and, you know, modern college and career readiness um, are not necessarily the same thing. And so it really depends on like what city and what state you're in and how they wrote those standards. Um, but if the question was um, more talking about the need that we have decided in this country, and I say this as a former English teacher, like we need to teach kids to read Shakespeare and write essays about Shakespeare and literature and poetry and like, I, I love all of that stuff and I want our young people to do that. And to Jalissa's point, that's not necessarily developing the specific skills that will allow them to write a business brief or a cover letter, um, and, or, or maybe it is. And so I think that's really crosswalking those standards and saying, what is in these traditional standards like um, analysis, like a uh, uh, speaker's viewpoint, like um, doing audience analysis, which is a really important and perspective taking a really important SEL skill. So I think really mapping those onto college and career readiness is back to what we said at the very beginning. It's let, let kids develop skills and then actually let them practice them. Um, too often the traditional classroom, the teacher is up front, they give all the um, explanation and they give instructions with like every single step filled out. That's not college and career ready because college professors don't do that. And no boss I have ever had in my life does that. They say, here's my problem, Lindsay, I would like you to fix it by Friday. Let me know if you need support. And a college professor says, here's your prompt for your writing, go off and, and give me 10, pa 10 pages on this. Um, so I think it's not necessarily even always about the standards themselves. Um, as far as the content standards, it's the skills-based standards. Show me that you can do problem identification, um, audience analysis, ideation of a basic prototype or a basic solution to a problem. Write, write a very clear one-page draft. Like, can you draft? Get feedback. So it's, it's processes and it's skills and it's less what year did someone do something that you can google on your smartwatch or you know what is the difference that i had to teach to get my kids to pass the english regents similes and metaphors and again all these lovely things that do not translate um so i, I don't necessarily know that you can do all those things at the same time i don't know that we should try to i think we should take a hard look at both sides um, and really ask ourselves which ones of these uh, which sets of these standards and skills and content is actually going to set our young people up for success in 2020 not 1920. Yeah. If I can just catch a, a little bit of that too, Rain. Um, there was recently a, a young man who decided that he was going to make a, a presentation to his city council on the importance of uh, removing the, the the language of boneless chicken wings from local restaurants. Uh, and this young man went up. He made an argument. He addressed counter arguments. Uh, he he used the perspective of others uh, and and made his case. Um, in in our schools, we teach. Uh, argumentative essays as the way to write an essay, how to pass an argumentative essay exam, right? In fact, you use argument all the time. I need a raise. I don't want boneless chicken wings. I want to convince my neighbor to vote for whoever they want to vote for. 
Lindsay is saying that if we just abstract these things one more level and focus less on I am doing this thing so that I can pass the test and focus on what the actual employers, what our actual society needs, then we're going to take a content standard that says write a persuasive argument uh, essay and realize that we're not writing essays. We're teaching people how to make arguments, how to solve problems. And if we do that, our societies will benefit, our communities will benefit, and our students will have that social and economic mobility we all care for. Great. Well said. Rain, I think um, I, I see the clock and I know our guests have um, uh, signed up to stay till five o'clock. So we're going to respect that. And um, I, uh, I have to say, I, I am so proud to be associated with this team, um, including our board. And I see a number of you in the, in the group. Um, and we're gonna now sort of call from the audience, if you will, Tony Kaiser, our, our board chair, um, for a few closing thoughts. Thanks everybody. Great discussion. Um, I learned a lot. Our audience, wherever they are, do we ever get to see them? No. Let's fix that, don't you think? Uh, we should see our people. Uh, so for those of you out there who are our friends and supporters uh, and to this wonderful group of people who I'm looking at now uh, in the Hollywood Square boxes, um, thank you for being here this evening. This is really a, a great occasion. I hope we can do these more, whatever that means, you know, as needed more often, get the discussion rolling. Uh, but to uh, all of you, Rain and Lindsay, Jane, thank you for hosting. Uh, am I saying it correctly? Julissa? Julissa. How do I say it? Julissa. Uh, thank you. And um, Kristen, David, always a pleasure to see you. And uh, everybody, farewell. Thank you. Am I doing this the right way, Kristen? <laughs> okay, thanks. We'll do it again. I look forward. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, everyone, for being okay. here.